All right. Um, yeah, I'm Ryan Kressel, and I'm speaking on behalf of Mercator Geological Services. I'm just going to speak it about one of the um, services that we've been developing in-house at Mercator. Um, we're a Halifax-based company, but we like to work in Newfoundland, so that's why we're here. Um, so the topic is on prospectivity mapping and AI and how those two are connected together. A lot of people do know these topics today and people are using them. Um, so I'm just kind of doing an overview of how we're using them ourselves. So just to kind of start off, I was going to start off by just giving the kind of a basic definition of what prospectivity mapping is. So we can kind of differentiate it from the AI component that we're going to merge with it later. Um, so it's just a data mining method. Simply that's how we use it. We mine data and we create targets using it. That's the idea. The result is essentially a heat map that can be, it's commodity specific, so we can look at a number of commodities. The ones I have listed here are just critical middles that people are looking for currently, but there's really no limit to what you can look for in it. So you can feed your data set in and look for what you're looking for, so you kind of decide that. And the last point here I just want to talk about is why we're doing it. It's all about de-risking our projects. For um, We want to reduce cost and the time spent on it. It's very expensive to explore, so if we do the work beforehand, we can actually kind of have a more um, spearheaded and more focused program that can ensure better success for our uh, clients. Um, and so kind of backing up on what prospect prospectivity mapping is and how it's been done, it's not always been connected to AI, though often that's what you see mostly um, in the papers these days as people are doing data-driven, but traditionally, or what I call the traditional ma method or knowledge-driven I post in here, um, that's kind of been around for decades, so it's just pretty much taking all the data you have in a GIS and you're layering them on top of each other. You're doing simple arithmetic between them, using fuzzy logic, and you kind of design an algorithm that just kind of highlights the areas where all your features geologically are coming together to highlight that area. So usually that algorithm is designed by a geologist, so they use textbook, the literature reviews, and also what regionally um, defines that kind of deposit in the area you're looking. Um, so that's different from the data-driven, the AI approach, which you don't tell it anything, you just kind of feed the data and tell it what it, to find the patterns in the data to identify what a deposit looks like. So it's like showing an image of what a deposit is in your data set and allow it to do that. Um, there's a number of algorithms that are used for that. I kind of list, list just a few of the major ones that are used here. So random forest is very common, produces great results, very simplistic. Um, the one you might have heard of mostly is the ANNs, the artificial neural networks. Um, that's what people are calling the deep learning or the black box. Um, and the convolutional neural networks are kind of taking charge these days that people are using those because you're getting the best results um, better than the random forces that were previously performing. Um, I just put this flow chart to kind of give an idea of the workflow. And it's kind of to show the difference between going those two approaches, which there isn't much difference. So we kind of call this the plug and play model. When you have all your data, setting it up is the same either way you go and how the results look are essentially the same. So they produce kind of the heat map either way, but in the middle of the whole program of it, you can kind of choose which direction you want to go. So you kind of choose the model you want to go with, either a knowledge-driven or a machine learning AI model in there. But there's no limit. You could actually just plug and play all of them. You can put infinite amount of models in the middle, which we often like to do. So it's um, kind of a simplistic kind of approach to look at the way that the workflow is. And just talking about the data and where it comes from, um, there's different sources. The, easily, the most easily accessible is the publicly available government data. We just download them from the web page. These are just examples of what's available from Quebec. We did a lot of work on this in the uh, James Bay area for lithium last year. And so this is kind of the examples you'll see a lot from that area. Um, we also can compile it manually from PDF reports. We've all done that. We're just digitizing data. And the best case scenario is when our client brings us the data already organized that we can feed into there. So we can mix all three of the types of data sources, um, but it does take a bit of work to actually amalgamate the data. They need to be formatted and unified. Um, a common problem is just from public data is some is point data, some is qualitative polygons, some of it's line data, and all that has to be kind of made into numeric values that can be fed into, fed into the AI. So there's a lot of setup that actually goes into the work before you actually get to do the fun part, creating the prospectivity map. This um, diagram just kind of demonstrate the process in itself and what it looks like behind the scenes. So on the top left is what the heat map looks like. So it's pretty much where the pink colors is, is your most perspective area. We would say the highest probability of finding the deposit type that you're desiring. And then behind that, there's just a bunch of layers kind of stacked up behind there. 
that kind of come together there. This kind of shows nine layers. That's not usually it. It's usually in the hundreds of layers. And each layer can represent anything from a single element in a single geochem database to a single property in the bedrock geology, or um, uh, also each layer would represent geophysics. <coughs> and this um, plot here, just kind of demonstrate what goes behind the knowledge driven and kind of give you a hint why people are moving towards the more AI way of doing it. There's still a lot of work to design a knowledge driven model. So the geologist does come out of school with a lot of knowledge and understanding what to look for. And then to take that when you have hundreds of layers of data, so high dimensions of data to look through, you kind of have to design and tell the computer how to do the math for that. So a simple way to do it is just assigning weights to different features in there. So the way we've done it here to kind of make it manageable is we just kind of break it into main categories. So lithology, LCT is for lithium, cesium, tantalum. So this is a lithium model, primary pathfinders, secondary pathfinders, and then structure. So we kind of branch everything that way, but each of those branches has their own weights for each of those other features that go into it. So there's a lot of organization and knowing your data that goes in that before you actually produce the map. So, and then you have to revise these because you're not happy with the first results. So you end up redoing it again anyway. So. Um, and that's why when we go to these supervised machine learning AI models, it actually simplifies this process a lot and gives you a lot more freedom that you can do a lot more commodities at once than having the limitation of building one of those knowledge driven for every kind of commodity you're looking for. Because even for like gold, there's more than one type of gold deposit and they're not always going to be the same model that you do for the knowledge driven. So you have to write it for every kind of gold if you're looking for a generic gold model. So with, the knowledge, with using AI though, all you're doing is you're labeling your data. So you pretty much say, this is what a deposit looks like in this area. So you would no take a known mine, label it as a known deposit, and then you find areas equally that are not deposits, and you feed it into it, and your model's supposed to find it itself. And so the example that's kind of shown at the bottom here, so it builds those weights itself, is just how a random forest, which is probably one of the simplest um, machine learning algorithms there are out there, and it just kind of creates like, 100 decision trees that all vote if it's a deposit or not a deposit. And then that's the score that it gives to it, a probability associated with it. Um, the case study I'm gonna go through, because I've talked a bit about James Bay. Um, this is kind of what, we did a lot of work on this last year. We had a lot of um, clients last year come to us. We had about six clients with about 50 properties that we had to look at. So we had a problem solve, because historically we were just kind of doing project by project and we just do it individual compilation projects. But since we had so much area to cover, to cover for so many properties, we decided to just do a regional compilation map and do a whole prospectivity for the entire James Bay and just kind of clip in for each of our clients to make it more cost effective that we could actually achieve it in the time we needed. So it was kind of the approach. And this has kind of led to what we're developing now because we've been able to kind of increase the scope of our work. And so it was fairly successful that we, um, every property essentially has targets on it because it just kind of is a probability map. But it did lead us when we went into the field to look at some of these properties. We found pegmatites that weren't mapped before. They weren't always spodumene buried, but four of them were. So we did find some new spodumene occurrences in the area on our client's property using this tool. So it was successful. Um, and the way it works is that it just essentially would get coordinates, target coordinates that we can actually go to on site. So our geologists would use these targets to kind of just bump around the site and find the area. Because they only usually have like two days on site. So we kind of maximize that time. So we try to tell them where they're going to find the most likely success. So we can guide them in there. They come with tablets with the prospectivity maps loaded on them that they can use on site. And this is uh, what it looks like. So the build up to the uh, big heat map. So this is the knowledge driven models. We do have a knowledge driven and an AI driven model for the James Bay area. We kind of use those for comparison. And so this is what the knowledge driven looks like. It's filtered down to only kind of show the most significant values. Everything else is just kind of background in there. Um, but we were happy that it was able to identify, based on our knowledge, the location of the main lithium occurrences in the uh, James Bay area, plus the main corridors that we know that are lithium bearing. So um, the results were positive, and we were able to use this to kind of clip in um, on the project scale. I'll show a case study of that shortly. And this is what the uh, AI-driven model looks like. So it also was able to pull up the same locations, and it got the same cores, the general trends. There is variation in the shape of them. Our model that we made for the knowledge-driven seemed to like the faults a lot more. Whereas this kind of heat map really cleaned onto the geochemistry and kind of like 
zoomed out a bit, so they're a bit broader, the, ta the target areas, but they kind of pinpoint on the same areas within there. So overall, having the computer find these areas on its own without any guidance was a success. And um, I know a lot of people call it the black box, but we can look into it a bit. So we get some information from it that we can actually evaluate that it's there. So this is just the feature importance and just kind of ranking all the features that were used um, by the AI when it identified it to, uh, to train on that it would use to actually find the um, mineral occurrences. And <coughs> it's actually not too far off of what we came up for our knowledge driven. Amphibolite, which is at the very top here, is a known, well known by everyone, that it's the main host of the LCT pegmatites in the uh, James Bay area. We got tourmaline, barrel occurrences coming near the top. Um, cesium, lithium, tantalum, of course, coming up there, and plus other pathfinders and some geophysics. So it was not unreflective. It reflects quite well what we came up with our knowledge driven. So we are happy that the AI was able to learn this just by feeding it its data, the same data set. Um, the next few slides are just going to kind of look through of how we would use this on a property scale. So this is one of our success projects that we looked at in the James Bay area. Um, it's Kansas West. It's uh, owned by Thin Resources. And so when our client asked us to kind of create targets that we can go and design a field program based on them, this is kind of the results look at. So it's clipped down to their area or the area of their um, claims at the time that we did it. And uh, all those black outlined area, those are the targets that were generated. So we ca I call them, call them bullseyes because they're where there's little elevations. They're not always the maximum area, but there's a deviation from the background in those areas that kind of stand out. So those are the areas that we would send to our geos that they would go visit with the helicopter bumping around and make sure to check out those areas, find the closest outcrop and evaluate them. So I'm just gonna zoom in on the one on the uh, west hand side. And where the south where we saw the really high prospectivity is kind of like due to that amphibolite running through the south because that's the favorable host rock. Um, and we did find pegmatites down in that area so that really it was pulling out the occurrence of pegmatites that were not previously known on there, but we didn't find spodumen in that really hot spot. The spodumene was actually found to the north in that lesser target, I'll call it. Um, it was quite a large exposure of pegmatite and then some spodumene in it. And you can see a picture of the discovery outcrop on the uh, top right-hand corner and the mega crisp, the spodumene in there, um, also on the right. Um, one thing about this was, is really geologically, what people are looking for, that spodumene occurrence shouldn't really occur. But somehow our system was able to, or our um, prospectivity, did pull out an anomaly in that area. And this is one of the features that is nice about doing the knowledge-driven method over top of the AI method. We can actually really deconstruct and kind of step back and see which features are actually weighting these different targets individually. So these kind of subscores here are actually those main headers from the knowledge-driven here. And so if we actually like roll back and look at it, we can see that that spodumene occurrence, though it wasn't the strongest, was being pulled out still by the structure. It was actually the aeromag that pulled it out plus a combination with a primary pathfinder anomaly, which just happens to be a lake sediment sample with anomalous tin. So it's kind of like a lesson too that we kind of learned that it's, that's why it's important to look at all the dimensions of data because even though if you're just looking at lithium, cesium, and tantalum, you would never have found that kind of target area. But it's because we had all those secondary and third order um, anomalous elements being fed in there as well that it was able to pull out a target that we could just kind of feed. Okay, check out this spot, see if you can find anything and they flew over it and they found the outcrop. So it's kind of a nice lesson to learn that why we want to look at really high dimensions of data because there could be stuff hidden in there that you're not looking at because you can't humanly look at that much information. Next slide. Um, this slide here, I just wanted to demonstrate it's the same area. Um, the po purpose here was just kind of an experiment to kind of take that, um, that lithium <coughs> model and we just wanted to convert it over for another commodity. So it was kind of an experiment to test if we can um, switch commodities with the same data set, and that's what we did here. So it was just an experimental phrase here. It wasn't used for anything because there's nothing left to stake in this area, but we found it successful. This was done by um, the AI, so it was found out the main major trends in the area. Uh, I'm just gonna move on to what we're doing now, and just talking about our database system that we're building. And so. Just talking about the problems that we kind of talked about, and there's a lot of data that goes in there. And we found that even though AI is supposed to be speeding things up, it takes a lot of work to kind of massage or um, organize and unify the data 
and that we're losing probably about 80% of our project timeline, and this is kind of a consensus among other people doing similar things, is a lot more time is into data setup than actually running the AI. And so our solution is, is that we've got kind of a, our new database system that we're building is heavily data focused. We're organizing the data automatically. So everything we learned from doing the James Bay area that our geologists were doing to structure everything in GIS is now being doing, done automatically in our new software that's a database management system. And so that sets up what we call the data cube that could feed into the AI much quicker. So we don't spend weeks setting up data, we only spend an hour doing it now. So we've kind of lowered the time with that. And that's what we're building at this point. So that's where we're going with this. Um, we just call it as a basic name, prospectivity database management system for now. Um, it's cloud-based software that updates automatically. So it's designed through web portals where it's directly taking government data, connects into there and organizes it. You can add in proprietary data. Um, it's also uh, up the road, we're gonna be start scrubbing more uh, assessment report data to add into it. So it's really gonna be a feeder for data as it comes in. And there'll be no limitation on how many models we can run on that data set. So we can look at multiple commodities and multiple type of models to see that. So that'll almost, it's just a combined data set and prospectivity at the same place. And this is just kind of the pipeline that, um, how it looks. So the main structure that it looks like right now. And as it's listed here, we're kind of focused on Eastern Canada. Newfoundland has been our test area, so that's the one we're tapped into right now. So we do have all the government data feeding into it. And all these different points do exist, so we already are organizing the Newfoundland data into a data warehouse, which is then restructured after the data is stored and cleaned, brought into a data cube that can feed in, and we can choose areas now that we can train our prospectivity to look for gold, and then we can apply that to another area in Newfoundland to kind of see how does that look. And so um, I wanted to make sure we had a test study of Newfoundland for this. So we did run one late. So we're still in production of this, but all the pieces are there. We're still refining it. But we did run just a quick as a test area before this presentation is we wanted to take a known gold deposit to kind of proof of concept. And it was successful in the way that it did pull out. We were looking at the Valentine gold deposit and just kind of matching up where the pit locations are. So it did, as we filtered it out, show the locations there, as also with the Long Lake gold sh um, showing. Um, with Canterra, it's a little bit to the southwest from it, but it's because it's largely driven by the till sediments there. And right now we don't have a till direction uh, correction in there, but that will come. So um, this is, as I said, it's a preliminary result, strictly on public data. So we had no proprietary information. It was just what was webbed, portaled into from Newfoundland, and then brought into our system, reorganized, and then just ran using the knowledge-driven model for orogenic gold. Um, and so it's for a first pass, first experiment, I think I'm quite happy with the results that came out of it. And this is just some last points about why we're doing this. So despite it being for prospectivity, the whole repository of data is valuable in itself. We're finding that we're unifying our data between provinces and sources um, and storing that and being able to pull it out. Our uh, developer that's actually writing the code comes from a different background in marketing on the internet and he's teaching us ways to store data that as geologists we haven't typically done. So we're learning a lot of new tips and secrets about organizing data so that we can query it better and make it operate a lot quicker. So we're kind of trying to think outside of the box on this. Um, but it is a, driven by the idea of creating prospectivity models for uh, mineral deposits, which there'll be no limit really what we can do. And the last point here is just so we keep our eye on the prize and that this, the whole purpose is for mineral exploration. We're trying to de-risk and lower cost of mineral exploration to achieve better success for mineral exploration. And that brings us to the last slide. That's me. Uh, my contact is info is here. I'm here for the next day. So if you do want to chat with me, I am around. You can reach out to me. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you.